Paul Mensa's Wall of Power TV is brought to you in part by Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Two Gingers Irish Whiskey Grey Wolf Lodge, your home away from home in the North Woods and the Solar Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. We have a great show tonight featuring an old friend of mine, Stan Kipper, who's just a phenomenal drummer. Stan got started in the business way back when, right after the Civil War. But <laughs> over least. the years, yeah, over man. the years, Stanley has played with James Taylor, Minnie Ripperton, Joe Walsh, Melanie, the Bee Gees, and more. He also plays timbales and sings on my favorite guilty pleasure song, Thunder Island by Jay Ferguson. We've also been playing together on and off for years. And several years ago, Stan told me about this project he was working on and is debuting next week. From Behind the Sun shines a light on a black family in a red line neighborhood 60 years ago. We also have the co-author of the play, born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, way up there on the edge of the Iron Range, an actor yes, and a playwright mm -hmm. who worked with Stan on this show and we're happy to have her visiting from Seattle uh, tonight on Wall of Power TV, Laura Drake. Hello. Laura, Hi. welcome. Thank you. Stanley, good to see you, good brother. Good to see you, my brother. Thanks for having us. Oh. Thanks for having us. Been excited about coming to do the show with you, Paul. Well, it, it's so great to have you, Stan. When did the play, what was its genesis? When did you first put pen to paper? Or before that, when did you conceive of the idea? Well, uh, I was in Seattle visiting Laura, and I was, we were doing some work with the kids out there in the school, right? And she, we just started talking about the story one, uh, one evening. And uh, I was telling her about how it came to fruition, which was at the legendary Nice, where you and I both played, Paul and I both played at Nice, oh, I'm gonna say 10 years each. I played five. Yeah, I was there for I got the years. I got the music going on on that stage. I was the first band without an accordion player. There you go. <laughs> on what we called the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the voodoo lounge was uh, our particular side of knives. But on this, you know, I used to go in there. We were playing on Wednesdays was our residency, New Primitives. And I was going in there to set up in the afternoon, and it used to be these Older gentlemen sitting at the bar, these guys, are, there was like eight of them, right? And they, were, they would argue and talk all this stuff. They were, you know, whining about Obama and, and, and arguing with each other continuously, right? One day, and I ignored these boys for months. Right. And one day, right, I heard them arguing about the post office. And uh, they were like, you know, that place, you know, that place, they worked us like dogs. And they were just ba 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 ba. And I looked at these boys and I was like, I realized that they were my dad's age, you know. And I asked these dudes, I said, did you know, I said, hey, did you guys know Obi Kipper? And they all their heads shot around, they looked at me and said, yeah, we knew Obi Kipper. What's it to you? One of the dudes says to me. I said, well, I'm his son. Wow. And they went, oh, man, yeah, you do look kind of like him, right? And they're all sitting there, yeah, Obi Kipper. And did he work, uh, Stan, did, did uh, your dad work downtown at the main post office? Yes. Okay. You know, and there was this one guy at the end of the bar. He let out with this, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> did I know Obi Kipper? Ha. He said, you know that house? I said, what house? He says, you know, the house. And I, you know, the goosebumps, right? I said, and he said, ah, ah, boy, we really pulled one over on them then. Me and your old man, we had them by the, you know. Right. 
And I was like, what? And it all came flooding back to me, all these memories, right? Because it was like folklore right. to me because I was so young. But right? you were a young, you're a young kid at the time in 56. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it all came flooding back. And here was my old man's partner, one of the, the, his main partner that helped him get this house. Right. Right. Like the hoodwinking a black man story. buying a house in a white neighborhood in South Minneapolis in 1956. Yeah, yeah, couldn't happen. They wouldn't let it happen. And so uh, to give part of the story away, uh, my dad and one of his dear friends concocted this plan to uh, get Hoodwink the real estate agent yeah. right. through a, his Jewish friend. You know, so they, they came kind of together with places. this plan. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this, this particular individual and his wife posed at my mom and dad. They uh, hoodwinked the realtor guys because they got our names confused, you know. Kipper so, and Kippur. <laughs> <laughs> and they, 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 they dudes were like, whoop, whoop. I'm going to start calling you Yom. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about right there. So Stan told me this story mm -hmm. uh, one evening in Seattle, and, and I said, this should be a play. Wow. Right? And so I. And what year was this, Laura? This was a 2011. Wow. And um, so I have a theater background. I hadn't written a full length. You know, I'd written for my younger kids that I direct and stuff, but I, I kind of knew what to do. And we started this journey of uh, writing this, and it, it started out as a one-person monologue. Stan would kind of send stories on cassette tape and we were, we were working yeah, off we were cassette really old tape. School. We each had matching, we had matching te tape decks that played the same <laughs> right. speed with thin the cassettes back and forth. Oh, right. Right. And That's so the, old school. Man. Oh, right. man. You and know. It, it, it went from a monologue to then we, through uh, Gail Smogard who produced this play, um, Kind of gave us some ideas, and we started writing it, taking all the characters that Stan was talking about, right, Stan, and making it a, a, a play. It started having 18 characters. It wow. was kind of like a film, right? It was huge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and of course, being, being neophyte playwrights, you know, we went to see Lou Bellamy. Or the with man. Penumbra, yeah, yeah the main guess. guy. And Laura, of course, was in the original cast of Penumbra way back in the day. Yeah. You know, not, when was that? 1977 yeah, to 1977. And for those people out there in the Wall Power TV land that don't know the Penumbra, that was really the place that uh, germinated August Wilson, yes, and where August Wilson really came to the floor. I saw almost every August Wilson debut play yeah. there, and yeah. I was so honored. Yeah. And uh, they still do amazing work. I think Lou's daughter has taken Lou, over. Lou, Sarah's yes, taken has. over. So, yeah. so why, you know, I contacted Lou and said, would you please read the script? And, and he a, did. And Black Nativity, too, is yes, my go-to. Fantastic. Yeah, so, so he read the script, and we went and met him over there. And he, he said, why don't you go to the Playwright Center? He said, you've got this and this and this, you know, kind of a lot going on here. Go on over to the Playwright Center, because that's what August had done as well. Yeah, the and cool thing that he said to us is, was, you know, he said, you know, I'm going to send you to the Playwright Center. He said, I sent August Wilson over there, <laughs> and I'm going to send you over there. Wow. So we went over there, right? And That's it's a blessing. It, it is. And we both became members. And, and it turned out to be, it's a, it's a wonderful place. And the thing is, it's here in Minneapolis. Right on Franklin. And it, it's, it's a like, Franklin it's a Avenue. great it's place. It's an unusual place because there, there isn't a place like that in many, I mean, in Seattle, there's not like a Playwright Center. It's right. been there since the 70s. And in fact, Gail, our producer, was one of the early dramaturgs there in the 70s. You know, we're going to take a break here in a little yeah. bit. But before we do, uh, tell the people where the play is going to be, and who right. is co-producing it, yes. and who's all involved. Yes. Go ahead, Laura. Um, so it's produced, it's a co-production between the um, Metropolitan State University and Minneapolis College. And uh, it is being produced at the Whitney Fine Arts Center, the Whitney Fine Arts Theater inside the center, right by Loring Park. Yes, and it's, all, it's also being directed by Brian Grandison, a great yes. director. Yes. And of course, uh, like Laura said, Gail Smorgard is the producer. Right. And we're just, we're just and honored and, ex you know, we're yeah. just very they've, honored. They've done a phenomenal job working with us and, and to get it to come to fruition. Birthing it. You know, they've been, we've worked, we've all worked together from a very collaborative spirit. 
we've all you know, done little fillets here and there and added little things. And Brian is a, he is a director, he is an actor, and he is a playwright. And so he's, he has a, a great background. And, He's an African-American man about our age, and so he understands the play. He's done a great job with these student actors interpreting yeah, our it's work. Been just a wonderful, Very wonderful important. experience. I'm anxious to hear more about it, and we will on Wall of Power TV with my guests Laura Drake and Stan Kipper. Their play is debuting next week. I've been, Stanley's been telling me about it for the last handful of years <laughs> when we've been lucky enough to play together or bump into each other. So we're going to find out more about From Behind the Sun, and we'll be back after these messages. Welcome back to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzen. We are having a really enjoyable conversation about a play that's debuting next week in Minneapolis called From Behind the Sun. We have the two playwrights here, Laura Drake, who's in town from Seattle, and my old buddy, Stan Kipper. Tell us a little bit about when you started to write the play, as Laura, as you said in the last uh, part of the show, it's, it was going to be a one-man narration. And then tell us how all the, the Big River, the one-man uh, narration started to develop all these tributaries. Oh, we, uh, we were so new at it, right, that we, there were so many stories to tell that we just kind of weaved a very theatrical um, story behind it. It's about my mother, it was about my father, it was about uh, the journeys that they made. Um, uh, Coming from Missouri. Yeah, to Chicago, to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. It had all these other stories in there and of course we loved every ro word that <laughs> right, we wrote. Right, right. So you know, it's hard to edit us, Paul. Yeah. We were like, what the hell are you talking about? We got the old and the oh, New Testament. Right, now. right. I mean, so, I read it all covered, man. Right. We and, covered it all. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so one of the main things is, is we started to work with dramaturgs, okay. which helped you develop a play. We went over to the Playwright Center. We worked with Christina Hamm first. Okay. And we were concerned that the play would be too much like Raisin in the Sun, the mm -hmm. famous Lorraine Hansberry play. And she said, no, it's not Raisin in the Sun. It's a kind of a similar story about a black family trying to buy a house in a white neighborhood right. in the 50s. But it's, just, it's a different story. So that was great. And we developed it with her. And then um, Stan took some playwriting classes at the Playwright Center. Right. I, you know, the thing was that I had to learn had to learn how to do it right. I was trying to make a connection between the flow, between writing the play and writing songs. But it's not like making records, right? So I had to learn how to, had to, to learn how to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I worked with, um, oh, geez, yeah. Winter Miller in New York. I worked with Andrew Rosendorf at the Playwright Center. Just got a bunch of great support over there as I, saturated myself in the process. It right? takes a village, right? Right. Yeah. right. And then in Seattle a couple of years ago, we had, a, we had a reading of the play as it was at that time with my actor friends at my house, and we had a chance to really hear it and, and went from there as well and got opinions from, from those folks. And uh, we were- So at that point, Laura, yeah. if you don't mind me jumping in, yeah. how many characters were in it? Uh, the, uh, th there were about eight or nine. Okay. And then we brought it down to like six for the Playwright Center reading. And then we brought it back up to eight, I believe there are now, because we, we added another nun in the Catholic school scene. And, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, the thing about Did she it, hit your knuckles with the, with the uh, uh, ruler? She, she's, uh, she's slapping, she's <laughs> slapping. She has a ruler in the she's play. Got she's ruler. got a ruler. She's working it too, Paul. She's <laughs> work, working that ruler like a professional. <laughs> Yeah, you know, nobody can smack rulers like the nuns. No disrespect, <laughs> sisters. Right. But we have Excuse eight me. characters now, you know, and it's the, his parents, uh, Obi and Mary. Angela and Abe are the, the couple that help them and that are, they have another relationship growing. We've expanded their relationship. We have the son who we started out being an eight or nine year old boy, which this reading you saw, and now he's 14. Okay. So it's a different, it's a whole different and relationship. And that's the young Stan? Yeah, Tyler. Okay. Yeah, so now it's a combination of, um, my brother and I, when we were we were older, at like 13, right? So. Um, the whole process has been amazing. The rewriting, you know, it's like doing a, the similar ground between what we're doing when we're making records is that uh, unless we just kill it on the first take, we always know that our our overdubs are going to bring it home, right? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like that with the play. It's like throughout the rewriting, we, we're just able to 
it's become part of the process, you know, it's... Uh, that's, a, that's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the rewrite and, and the overdubs. I love it. Right. Yeah, because you know, all of a sudden you go, you know, you don't know until you hear it coming back that whether or not it's actually. Right. Most it's, of the time, it's you, like, man, that is so cool. But sometimes it's like, why, why it, did we do that? Right. right. <laughs> if you, if you, once you, you, know? you have to hear actors reading it, and and it's got to have, a, if if I can use this analogy. Uh, Stan and Laura, it's got to swing. That's right. It does. It does. It's, it's got to flow. There's got to be a rhythm to it. And, and our process also has, has uh, you know, evolved through the years in terms of one scene we were kind of struggling with. We just decided to take on the characters of Obie and Mary and put the cassette tape on and, and improvise the scene and taped it. We just said, okay, what would happen? And from that, I you know transcribed it, and we looked at it, and we we were able to to look at it, and, and then other times they'll say like, oh, we need another scene between Angela and Mary, so we'll both write a scene. I'll be in Seattle, he'll be in Minneapolis. We'll write a scene, we'll take a look at both of what we wrote, and we'll kind of mix and match Ooh. what we like the best from it. That's and so right. those are different ways that we've uh, we've worked when we've been uh, you know Excuse in different me. cities. Well, Laura, you've had uh, the great opportunity to work at the Penumbra mm -hmm. uh, with August Wilson and all the fantastic body of work he produced. So, so you had, uh, as a white gal, born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, you already had a nice background in kind of the black culture via August Wilson, the flow, uh, ways of speaking, yeah. and I'm sure you have black friends, but, but did that influence this at all? So yes, of course, that, that influenced me because I did five shows with them and wow. I lived right there in that community in St. Paul. And um, yes, of course, it influenced me a great deal. And the first show I did when I came to Seattle because um, Abdul Salam El Razak, who just passed away, was a very important member and he, an actor. His brother was running Black Arts West in Seattle. And that, uh, the first week I was in Seattle, I auditioned and I got a job with No Place to Be Somebody of Pulitzer Prize winning play at Black Arts West. So, um, you know, I was able to, to, to do that. And I've always um, advocated for, you know, diversity in theater. And I've, it was a privilege uh, to be a part of that company. Can, you, that can you tell me your favorite August Wilson story? Because I just revere the man. He used to, <laughs> when I, my band Cats Under the Stars, used to play, uh, we did four years of Tuesdays at the 400 bar in Cedar and Riverside in the West Bank. There was this black guy that used to have a tweed coat. He'd be smoking camel straights nonstop, and he'd be right in this little notebook. Mm -hmm. And years later, I see a picture, I go, that was August Wilson. Mm -hmm. you know? And I I've saw almost every play that was at the Penumbra. Right. Give me at least one great August Wilson story. Well, something that's kind of close to my heart is that um, at one point, um, he liked wearing hats like fedoras, and, and I had a wonderful old gray Stetson in perfect shape that I gave to him, and he gave me a poem. Wow. Yeah, so. It's a sweet poem, yeah, too. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's, he, he was very kind of shy and, and um, just a brilliant guy. Just yeah. brilliant, yeah. Yeah, and of course, for us now, with Gail Smorgard, our producer, she was, uh, you know, That's she, she's got to be a Norwegian, right? She oh. is. Yeah. yeah. I've known really Gail since I was 13. They were in I high school to together, but man, she theater. was, she uh, has been a big supporter of mine, right? And uh, when she saw some of my earlier stuff, she gave me some great encouragement and just said, oh my God, you know, you, you need to uh, dig deeper into this. Mm -hmm. And she would, told me, you know, because she was used to run the Playwright Center when August was there. And she said, Stan, when August came in with fences, it was over four hours long. Wow. And I was like, what? She said, yeah. I said, August rolled in there with this long ass <laughs> stuff. And we were like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. you know, so I was, I liked, I took that to heart. So I was like, wow, because our first thing, my, our earlier reference and my first efforts were really over the top, Oh, yeah, too. and right. when I, even when I saw King Hedley in, in uh, you know, Seattle so speaking of on, rewriting, four hours. but the yeah. fact that she was there when he was there and the fact that he was at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis really um, uh, made me feel a kinship there, right? And um, it, it's just a wonderful thing. Well, my favorite uh, Bob Dylan line from It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, take what you've gathered from coincidence. Yeah, man. <laughs> We're going to have more with Laura Drake and Stan Kipper. Co-authors of a great new play, From Behind the Sun, 
We'll be back on Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzner, after these messages. Welcome back to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzner. I'm really enjoying our conversation tonight with actor and playwright Laura Drake, musician and playwright Stan Kipper. But before we get back to this great play that's debuting next week in Minneapolis called From Behind the Sun, we got to talk a little Hollywood because uh, Laura has <laughs> been there and back. <laughs> As in Stan, <laughs> this ain't Stan's first time around the block either. <laughs> Hollywood, you know. So Laura, let's, let's talk a little bit about, you're still getting residuals from uh, Sylvester Stallone. Oh yeah, get residuals from several things. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I was in LA for 10 years and I did. Uh, what, years I, were, what years were that? 84 to 94. Okay. And uh, I was a part of a theater company, I did theater regularly, but um, I, you know, I did some film and TV and I, you know, I didn't have big roles, but I was on some pretty big um, productions. Um, I, I did Stallone's movie Cobra. I you know, was a murdered waitress in that. I was <laughs> on L.A. Law and um, Hill Benson. Street. Yes, Hill I love that show. And Hill Street Blues. I, I was on the show. last season of Hill Street Blues. And um, I did um, Ghost. I'm in Ghost. I have wow. a nice little scene with Demi Moore. Uh, I was six months pregnant at the time, so my daughter always says she was in Ghost, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, you, did you ever know a bump into my buddy... Um, uh, Chris Mulkey out there. Oh, I, I, I was in a show at the Minneapolis Children's Theater with okay. Chris called and He his, Who Gets Slapped. And his lovely uh, Karen. departed wife, yes. Karen Landry. Yeah, just a sweet a high school. So the high school with right. Stan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've had, uh, Chris was on one of our first shows on Walla Power TV. Yeah, and his was very successful. I mean, quite successful out in L.A. I just uh, yeah. turned on Better Call Saul about six months ago. There he was mm -hmm. with yeah. Rhea Seahorn. Yeah, so, so then and, and, and then I played, I was the uh, Vecma. I have my card, and I'm in the encyclopedia for Star Trek, The Next Generation. I wow. was the first uh, speaking female part on the particular TV series. Yeah. That is phenomenal. Playing on. Yes, I still get uh, fan letters from Germany. They want me to sign the card. Just <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. But Stan, yes. she, uh, tell us a little bit more about your friend Laura. Well, Laura has this business in Seattle. It's the longest running theatrical program for kids in, yeah. in West Seattle. And uh, they do classic theatrical performances. This summer she has nine different camps going. Aladdin. Matilda. You know, wow. she, um, and over the years, right, she's, every wicked. summer she's done these great things for these kids and, and it's wonderful. Um, it's called Stage Struck. Yeah, it's Stage called Stage Struck, Struck Seattle. Seattle. Is, the, is the website, yeah. And uh, it's really something. Uh, all the costumes they have, they have um, care for the kids before they show up. They got care for the kids afterwards if the parents can't get there quick enough. And the kids uh, do excellent performances. Uh, the times that we there, that I've been there working with them, the quality of the performances is really high because. Uh, she expects the kids, and so do I. We expect them to do it just like we do, right? It's not a really cute, oh, the kids look so cute on right. stage. Well, the people wow. I hire are mostly my actor friends who know how to put on a show. Right. And uh, musical directors as well. I always brag to people about Stanley Kipper because you play every Tuesday night with the New Prims, the New Primitives. Uh, I always refer to the New Primitives as the North, as the Minneapolis version of the Neville Brothers because oh, you man. throw down like them. Well, thank you, and Paul. Best dance band in town. But you've, Stan Kipper, played with Minnie Ripperton, the legendary, the late great Minnie Ripperton, and your first gig with her was at Madison Square Garden. It was, you know, my <laughs> first, you know, Minnie. I mean, we knew each other from back in the day, right? From back when we were, and she was in Chicago. But I, you know, I was with Gypsy. Gypsy had broken up in LA and I was, you know, we, we talked and all this stuff. But she, uh, I got this call from her <laughs> in the middle of the night, right? Um, and I'd never been in a limousine before or anything like that. And her, her road manager was sitting at the basement of my, uh, bottom steps of my apartment. And after, uh, figuring out it was me, he said, you know, Minnie's been looking all over town for you. He says, w what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I was getting ready to go out and eat dinner. He says, uh, um, 
well, Minnie wants you to join the band. And I said, well, when? He says, like, right now. <laughs> I said, really? He said, uh, will you do it? And I said, well, yeah. He said, well, good. And he took these cassettes out of his pocket. He said, learn these songs. There's a limousine coming to get you at 4.30 in the morning, which was in L.A. And he says, tomorrow night, your first gig is going to be at Madison Square Garden. It's sold out. Minnie's opening for Stevie. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> I'd never been to New York at that time, right? Wow. And of what course. What a way to go, enter the oh, city. Oh, man. And it was really heavy, right? Because Minnie was such a sweetheart. And of course, people don't know this, but she was in Irv Azoff's, um, was her manager. And Irv at that the time. the Eagles. Yeah, he others. had the Eagles. He had Joe Walsh. He had Minnie. He had Jay Ferguson, and uh, so from that, from my connection with Minnie, is how I was able to meet Jay and Joe and all this stuff. Was, Minnie was ahead of her time. She was really something. Stan, I got to ask you, that had to be an incredible uh, hair-raising moment playing with Minnie Ripperton at Madison Square, Gar Madison Square Garden. Did you have that same kind of hair-raising moment the first time we played the patio at Moe's in Mounds View? I did. I was shook. <laughs> I was shook. I was shook. I was shook down to, down to the core. I was sitting up there with my deep soul warrior brother, Paul Metz, and I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? You know what we did? We threw down. We got rid of him. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, we're having fun. My guest, the Laura Drake and, and Stanley Yom Kipper uh, tonight. We're, we're going to circle back now for a little bit and talk about from behind the sun. Where did the title come from? A song. A song that my mother used to sing to me and a saying that she used to say to me, you know, when I was, when I was young, right? She always used to say, boy, you don't have anything to worry about. And I'd say, why is that, mom? She'd say, because your, son, your love comes from way behind the sun. Wow. And she had this little thing she'd hum to us, right? She said, don't you worry about anything. She said, your love comes from way behind the sun. You're always going to be all right. So make sure you share it. Make sure you share it, she used to say. Make sure you share it, right? Well, I, I, I've said for years, all male musicians are mama's boys. Absolutely. Right? And most female artists are daddy's girls. <laughs> That's my rule of thumb. But it's funny you should say that because we had a great uh, uh, fellow on the Wall of Power TV a couple uh, while back uh, named Dave Foley. Who's a, do you know Dave? Yes. He's a, a musician, um, entrepreneur. He runs the world's smallest record store on 38th and Grand. But everywhere he goes, it's an experience, and he's meeting new people. He's across from Victor's. Yeah, he goes, right, right. So he, for example, he's in New York City in an afternoon. Sees John Gotti walking down the street with Sammy the Bull Gravano. <laughs> Sammy takes a right, 20 cars, 20 black cars with uh, two FBI agents to each go, throw uh, Gotti up against the wall. <laughs> 30 seconds later, a white limo comes with Gotti's lawyer. They bust him. Dave sees it. See, and that ends. Sees some people walking, ends up, and the next thing he knows, he's at David Lynch's studio at an art opening. But <laughs> his mother told him, Long way to get back to the story. His mother told him once, David, when he was in high school, he goes, I'm worried about your sister, but you, he goes, you could have a good time in a telephone booth in South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> mothers, mothers and all these things. That's right. right. In, case, in case any of you don't know what a phone booth in South Dakota is like, I'm sure you got a picture of that, <laughs> you know. We are going to have a, one more segment uh, with my guests, Laura Drake and Stan Kipper, talking a little bit more about a play I am so excited to see called From Behind the Sun. Join us next week for more with Stan Kipper and Laura Drake, their great new show, From Behind the Sun, on Wall of Power TV. We'll save you a seat. <laughs> <laughs>